and they had a couple of things that didn't work out for them too well. Good morning. This is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parrots. Today is October 11th, 2015. We are recording on YouTube a program which is live on iVlog.tv. And we've had some difficulty getting started, and now that we're on live, if I can find what I just did with my notes... We have a rather interesting subject we're going to discuss today. How could I lose my notes? I've been sitting here. I haven't gone anywhere. How could my notes not be here? They have to be somewhere close by. Um, this isn't too professional, is it? Here are my notes. <laughs> okay. Today, our subject is... and. Um, in reading the history of Halloween, uh, I came up with an article somebody wrote, and the name of it was Satanic, or Satanic, or Secular. And that just about fit what I wanted to talk about. Is it really about demons and devils and things, or is it what we do nowadays in the United States and in other uh, in modern countries. So it um, came out as a good topic for my message, which I happened on, on my mailing list yesterday to use and also used it um, on not only my personal mailing list to the people that I invite, but I think I put it on Facebook also. I woke up this morning, and you know this is less than a week old, and um, or maybe a week old, and um, they didn't do anything to me other than hand it to me because it was his time to go home. So why was he going to transfer everything from my other cell phone over to this one when he wasn't going to get paid for it? He went home, and I was, you know, having to try to do some of this stuff myself. Um, this is probably going to be a little different than what you all are expecting of me. But I think I'll be leaving you with some things to think about. We have three scriptures that we will eventually use. But before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about where did Halloween come from? If you live in the United States, you may not know that around the world, a something is being celebrated on November 1st. When I was teaching sixth grade, I used to do all of the things with my class that we were taught. In social studies, we studied Canada, Mexico, and then Central South America and the Caribbean nations. So on Christmas, we did the caminata, walking all over Mary and Joseph, looking for a place to stay. Now, you do know that that's not even scriptural, right? You look in the Bible and show me where Mary and Joseph walked all over town looking for a place to stay and were, were turned down. The Bible gives us one place they went. And because the Caesar had the whole world going back to the, their origin so they could be taxed, uh, the whole world was looking for an inn to stay in. And Mary's urgency was that she was about to have a baby, like, now. But we get these ideas that we think are scriptural. And when we get to um, that season of the year, you'll hear me go through some of the stuff that people think are in the Bible that really isn't. And I'll show you what really is. But we get ideas about, and the Bible says this. Well, maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. 
if you don't check it out, you don't really know. But getting back to Halloween, Halloween is an observance of the evening before a holiday. What's a holiday? I uh, didn't have anything but a pink felt tip pen. So we're going to look at pink this morning. Okay. Um, here we go. You're going to be amazed at some of this stuff. You all know what the vowels are, right? A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. You know that if you're taking a word and you're changing that word a little bit, like from present tense to past tense, you will sometimes change a letter. Well, here is holiday. Look at the middle. H-O-L-I-D-A-Y, that's holiday. But what did it start out to be? It started out being holy day. Halloween started out being in the 8th century when Gregory was Pope. Now, Gregory was a very important Pope. We used to have a different calendar than the calendar we have now. It was changed by 15 days. We had the um, a, a previous calendar and um, You've heard me talk about the fact that Christ was not born on day zero because we have from the birth of Christ this way, everything is uh, A.D. after Christ. And before Christ's birthday, everything was B.C., before Christ. So isn't it logical that Christ was born on like zero? And then one year from then is one year after Christ. Well, you know, because of the error that the Pope found and the calendar was changed, um, we were off by four years and about 15 days. So actually, Christ was born in 04 or 4 B.C., there were no printing presses and the only way to correct what was going on was just to tell everybody in the world okay everybody just move your calendars this way and we've been living with that for 2019 years uh, nevertheless Gregory found this error, that Gregory was an important pope. The church, Catholic church, had not formally set a date. Now, you know that, I think everybody knows that Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. How do we know that? Because the Bible doesn't say when he was born, but the Bible does say that Caesar Augustus taxed, picked a day to tax the whole world. The whole world was going to travel, or unless you lived where your ancestors lived, you were going to travel. Not likely in uh, European geography are people going to travel is or, or is Caesar Augustus going to have them do this in the winter? It's more likely at a season that traveling was good. So it's more likely in the summer. Nevertheless, when something happens and when the church decides to celebrate, it might change. If you're Catholic or if you've gone to Catholic masses, you know that each day, uh, the church has a reason for that mass. 
Now, there was a time when I spent nearly a year in the hospital, in a Catholic hospital, and we became very good friends. There was a fellow that died, and he had no family, or his family didn't speak to him or something, and then they were just... I was sort of pastoring some of the people in that hospital. He even told me where he had money hidden. He would come in and out of thinking logically. And he told me, I know that part of the time I, I don't think properly. So I've got to tell you something now that my brain is working. And he, he told me where he hid some things. Well, he upped and died. So I was trying to get the funeral director and find out family or do something. In the middle of all of that. I decided he should have a funeral, but I'm in a Catholic hospital as a patient. So I asked uh, one of the nuns, get the priest to let me have a small funeral for him because relatives will show up and when they do, they're going to want to think, I, I don't care what their religion is. They're going to be thankful that there was a funeral as opposed to just dumping him in the ground. Uh, and as it turned out, that was correct. <laughs> but uh, they had a rule that Protestant ministers could not preach in the Catholic chapel. So they just decided they would do him a funeral and they would invite me. And that's what happened. Now, when you go to Mass, each day is a Mass for a particular thing, but you can do, the priest can do the Mass for other things also. Now, Pope Gregory, in 700-something, realized that, and this goes very close to what we've been studying on Wednesday nights about pagan ceremonies. Remember Solomon, the smartest man in the whole world? Hi, Ben Yang. Welcome some of you guys that have just dropped in. Um, you remember how smart he was? Uh, he knew things about botany and <laughs> people from all over the world would come to listen to him lecture on things like that. A brilliant man. Not too brilliant when it came to women. He was 12 years old when he started to rule. And he had a thousand wives and concubines. And at the beginning of his rule, he ruled for 40 years, as did David and uh, um, Saul. At the beginning of his reign, he was very brilliant, very young. And of course, he wasn't all that interested in women. But after a few years, he was. And... He even had one wife that he had for political reasons. She was the daughter of the pharaoh of Egypt. And he loved her. I mean, you've got a thousand wives and concubines. You don't have feelings for all of them. But he had feelings for her. A lot of these wives and concubines were his because they were kids. When he became king, you want to... Uh, you become king, you become pope, you become president. People send you gifts. Uh, these gifts, by the way, I'll, I'll take care of your friend uh, requests later, guys. Uh, some of the uh, uh, things that uh, they did, uh, gifts that they give you, were wise. And they didn't, their countries were not big like our countries. In those days, without the technology that we have and the travel that we have, it would have been difficult. And in the days of David and Solomon, um, they had what were called, if, if you remember in your history, city-states. They were huge, like, like New York or like Los Angeles. Big, big places, but not a whole country. 
not all of Europe, not all of the United States, but a big place. So each one of these places would give them a life. So that's why he had all these lives. Well, they came from, they were given to him from around the world. So a lot of them were pagan religious people. And they served pagan gods. I'm eventually going to get to Halloween, okay? <laughs> Where we're talking about satanic or secular. All right. We know from our study, we're on Wednesday nights in the Old Testament, and we're studying at the present time in the divided kingdom. Each king, if he was a good king, he served God, and most of the people did, and because they served him, God blessed them. And if he wasn't a good king, he didn't serve God, and therefore most of the people didn't serve God, and therefore they weren't blessed with that particular king. We read from time to time, and we just started with Hezekiah being king of the southern portion of Israel, and he was a good king. The good kings, and we had good kings and really good kings. The good kings, when they became king, they would go to pagan areas and they would knock down what were called the high places. And they were literally, I'm going to say, 10 to 20 feet above the ground as you go by the, down the road. And then on top of these high places were the altars of the various pagan gods. Solomon, because I think it's important that we understand how much paganism can affect us even though we're not pagan. Solomon, at the beginning, would not go to the high places. I mean, his father was David. David, a man after God's own heart, the man that wrote most of the, or a great deal of the book of Psalms. But he loosened up. Oh, but he had his standards. Oh, he had his standards. He was not going to serve a pagan god. No how, no way. No paganism. But he loved Bathsheba. I mean, you know, he had feelings for her. So she was going to go to church in the high places and worship her pagan god. And Solomon went with her. But he worshiped the one true god. Can you imagine? I mean, really, imagine it now. Solomon. God said, Ask me what you want, and I'll give it to you. And he asked for wisdom. And God said, you know, whatever you would have asked for, if you'd asked for money, I'd have given it to you. But you asked for wisdom, so I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you money, too. Brilliant man. No. He wasn't going to serve a pagan god. But he went over to the high places, got at an altar of a pagan god, and served the living God. What is that? Come on. That's one step in the wrong direction. You say, he didn't serve a pagan god. No, he didn't. He served the one true God, but from where? And why? He's over there because he's following his true love, not the word of God. As king, he should have knocked those places down, and he didn't. What finally happened? 
how did he lose his kingdom? Why are we on Wednesday night studying the divided kingdom? We're studying the divided kingdom because the prophet Nathan came to him and said, you know what? Your father had many sons, but he and God chose you to be king after him. You should have a king after you out of one of your sons. But, because you didn't serve God, you're over, over messing with the pagans. I'm trying to lay a foundation that it's not silly or stupid for us to take a good look at the beginning of this. And Nathan the prophet told him, one of your sons will rule but over two tribes. And your servant will rule the northern area over 10 tribes. So what we've been studying on Wednesday night just brings us right up to today's lesson. Now, getting back to Pope Gregory, because we're talking about holidays, why we have them, why the church gets involved with them, why they make the decisions that they do. I showed you that the word holiday really comes from the word holy day. When the Y is changed to I, as you're allowed to do with the vowels, A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. I put this someplace. Now, Pope Gregory wanted to pick a day, like I told you, when I was in a Catholic hospital, I went to Catholic Mass. They read the Word of God, they pray. Hey, I'm at home in a situation like that. I'm not home at home with all of it, but I can adjust. I was very involved when many Catholic churches and many Catholic individuals became charismatic in the 70s. And here in Southern California, I worked with many priests and um, nuns because they had received the gift of the Holy Spirit, didn't know what to do, and it was not unusual for them to look after a Protestant minister who had some of that knowledge. And I had many, many services with them. I usually wound up playing the piano because I could play with music or without music. And they sang the same worship songs that we did. And uh, uh, especially was I friendly with many of the nuns. I mean, they were single. They were dedicated to their calling. And we had a lot in common. Of course, we did not have mass in common. We sang the same songs. We listened to the same sermons. We ate the same food after the services. But when it came to communion, we were not one. Because for the Protestant, the bread and wine is a symbol which we use when Jesus said to his disciples, drink this, this is my blood which will be shed for you, and take this, this is my body which will be broken for you. We Protestants use that as a symbol, and Jesus said, every time you do this, remember me. So that's what we do. Now to the Catholics, the priest's prayer, and there, there's a problem right now 
which has to do with the um, DNA. You know, not only people have DNA, but plants have DNA. And um, other things have DNA besides just people. And right now, there is a problem with, is there a trans substance? I can't say it, transubstantiation, where the wine and the bread literally changes into the body and blood of Christ. And by partaking of it, you are partaking of salvation. See, it's too big of a difference for my friends and I to, in some things you can uh, compromise some things, the difference is too great. Compromise means this side gives up a little, this side gives up a little and you move closer together. Well, it depends. What are you giving up? Is it worth coming together? And in the, in, in the case of Holy Communion or the Lord's Table or the Mass, we don't. But Pope Gregory had a problem. Uh, the pagan god Saturn was um, being worshipped and a lot of parties, pagan nations were having parties and doing a bunch of bad stuff. And there were some other pagan gods and Pope Gregory said, I would prefer the Catholics not get involved in those festivals, but they are fun. And how do you keep good Catholic people away from fun festivals? And says Pope Gregory, easy. You make a good, godly festival for the people to go to and have fun. And because each Mass has at least one person to whom that Mass is dedicated every year, Pope Gregory came up with Christ's Mass. Now, look at that, just like you looked at um, Holiday and Holy Day. Christ's Mass becomes Christmas. Boy, some of those people that don't want us to use the word holiday at Christmas want us to use the word Christian or uh, Christmas, don't realize that this, this comes from the Catholic Church. I don't care where it comes from. This is where it comes from. It, history is history. I can't change it. History is done. You can't tamper with it. But in the 8th century, Pope Gregory found a day that was only a few days different from the days that Good Catholics were going out and doing bad stuff, celebrating pagan days. So his hope was that they would all go to church and have mass. And that's where we get, because on the Catholic calendar, December 25th was a day open, and it was close to the days that unholy people were going to do pagan things, so the Pope made a good decision. Now, Pope made another decision. I told you earlier that somewhere, almost everywhere in the world, not in the USA, but almost everywhere in the world, November 1st is a day that the Pope, a Pope, I don't know if it was Gregory, decided that they would take a day everybody was using, and in some cases, they weren't doing good things on that day. So the Pope says, we will take this day in which people, including Catholics, are doing bad things, and we will try to make it a good thing. 
Now, what were the people doing? This day, November 1st, and, or, um, you know, I, I was, I was teaching in a school in Mexico. And uh, May 1st is a very big day because around the world it's May Day. And if you're not a Christian, you don't have a whole lot of days to celebrate. You really don't. So they celebrate May Day and Harvest Day. And what have non-Christians got left to celebrate, right? You celebrate your national days, the day in which your country becomes a nation, and your birthday, and a few things like that. All right. We celebrated during a five-day period. We had four celebrations. May 1st is the day that every country celebrates. When I was in Cuba, they, I was in Cuba on May Day. And the, they brought, they had parades. They brought out the tanks. They, they brought out their artillery and the soldiers. And they showed us all the, the, the big parades. Okay. Uh, because they got nothing else to celebrate. We don't. We have a lot of holidays, so we celebrate May Day, but not, we don't really celebrate it. We just mention, this is May 1st, this is May Day. All right, May 2nd is my birthday, so of course the whole school celebrated it. May 3rd was Dia del Maestro, Teacher's Day. You've heard of Secretary's Day in, in the United States. Well, in Mexico, they got Teacher's Day. Well... So, of course, we celebrated Teacher's Day. May 4th, we didn't celebrate anything, but on May 5, you've heard of the Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> so, when, May, when Mexico got victory over the, during that short period of time, when, when France, rather than Spain, uh, was kind of taking over uh, some of the areas of Mexico, and there was a big victory. And... Uh, that was Cinco de Mayo. So in those five days, we had May Day, uh, Teacher's Day, um, um, May Day, my birthday, Teacher's Day, and national holiday, Cinco de Mayo. Well, the Pope says... The whole world celebrates Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. Now, the pagans had one way of celebrating. They, um, in some cases, would put out chairs. Uh, I, I'm sure you know somebody that um, at one time or another has had an empty chair at the table in memory of a family member or relative that has just passed. And they would put out chairs for the living and for the dead. And they had different things similar to that that they would do to celebrate. This was the Celtics in, in uh, where, you know, long before the USA. Uh, before Christianity was big in Europe, uh, the Celtics had this practice. Not only they, but around the world, but we're talking about Halloween. And so they believed they got, they went from remembering the dead people that they loved. Now, when I was teaching sixth grade, uh, I took my toaster oven to school and um, my, uh, what is this, biscuit, and we made little um, bones, and um, I should have known better, and, uh, but when I could start doing something, I can get carried away and make a small thing a big thing. But I tried to make some of this stuff very real for my students. Uh, and we did things that were a, a, a bit spooky. Now, the Celtics, which, you know, are the ancestors of the English-speaking people, so that's what interests us more, they went from dead people to spooky people. Uh, I was in a 
I'd never been in a dollar store. I'd been in the 99 cent store, but I'd never been in the dollar store until the other day. And I went in and I saw these. Now, I had two lamps. They looked like lamps. And I had them, this part, by the, they, they looked like lamps. These looked like pumpkins, but. They looked like lamps, and I would have them, and they would get sun all day out of the window. And then if I walked through at night, they were a nightlight. And I didn't have to turn them on or off or whatever. So they weren't working anymore. And I saw these things. You can see the, see, there's a light. I can see it. I don't know whether I can make the cameras see it. I don't, there it is. See that light in there? Well, these things light up. I, I bought them, I don't know, sometime I was a, a, a down the mountain a few times the last week, and so I bought these for a dollar each uh, without really thinking it through that it was a good thing or a bad thing or a nothing thing. These were put on posts by the Celtics, our ancestors, um, to scare away the spooks of the dead. Now, the Pope made November 1st. The world was celebrating it whenever they celebrated it, but the Pope made November 1st for Catholics, Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. The mass was actually celebrated when, and it's also called All Saints Day. And I guess you know, if you know anything about the Catholic Church, you've got to be dead before you can be a saint. Now, in the New Testament, this wasn't true. If you read it, uh, the beginning of most of the books of the New Testament, they were letters. And they start out, you know, the Apostles Paul to the people that live in such and such a city. And it was usually to all the saints and so on. So they referred to each other as saints. Uh, it was in Antioch a long time. There have been Christians around for a long time. They decided to call them Christians because Christians follow Christ. I could have made a little sign of that, but I ran out of paper. But they referred to each other as saints. So to take a day in which we're not going to celebrate this missionary or this saint or Jesus or this disciples, but we're going to celebrate all saints on this day. So November 1st for the Catholic Church was a mass for all the saints. And that was on November 1st. But on October 31st is the Eve. You know what Christmas Eve is. It's the Eve before Christmas Day. And so... November 1st is All Saints Day, and October 31st is the eve of a holy day. And it looks like this. Hallow. By the way, hallow. Where have we heard that? Hallowed. Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, okay, this is how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father in heaven, your name is holy. Holy be your name. And so Halloween is the eve, the holy eve which comes before the official Mass for the Day of the Dead or the 
scene of All Saints Day. And one of the reasons they picked November 1st, just like they did at Christmas, picked December 25th, was because Saturn was a pagan god that many people were worshiping. And there were a couple of smaller pagan gods that were worshipped. And it was right around, and so the same thinking that Pope Gregory had when he picked December 25th for Christmas was the same day that uh, November 1st, the same logic that was used when November 1st became the eve of All Saints Day. Um, I don't want to see which of these. I guess I had prepared this and didn't show it to you. So I'll just hold it up here. Solomon, we discussed, he went to the high places, he worshiped God, but then he went to the high places and he worshiped pagan gods. That's nice. People do that. Um, in a minute, I've got another page about what I'm about to say. Um, Are we going too far? Are Christian people who say, I refuse to get excited about somebody Christians, whole churches, as a matter, whole congregations, celebrating a holiday, which started out to celebrate dead people, because the Pope couldn't keep his people doing what he wanted to do, so he came up with what he was hoping was going to be a good substitution. I've got an example of what Jesus did in a similar situation. But let me get the Bibles. I got one Catholic Bible. This is this is a uh, Protestant Bible. Uh, this is the Holman Christian Standard, which along with the um, uh, New King James Version and um, um, the uh, uh, International uh, NIV Bible. Are, those three, I think, are really good, safe Bibles. They're more modern than the King James, which, of course, many people think that's the only Bible there is. But, like you've heard me say, if you can't understand it, how's it going to help you? Maybe the best Bible there is. It's like certain food. After surgery and other times, sometimes I, after cancer, I just couldn't eat certain. There were five things or four or five things I could eat. Some of my friends, remember Granny Annie? She had a fit when she found out I was drinking Kool-Aid. I said, there's nothing else I can drink. And you, would, you certainly would not want me to not drink anything. But um, at any rate, uh, this is a good one. And I thought, since I have a, five, 50 Bibles around the house, and I passed by on my way up from closing the door to Captain's place, I decided to pick out a Catholic Bible, and I'll read a little. I've got three scriptures to read. And then I'll go into, should we celebrate Halloween? If we do, should we? How should we? And if we do or if we don't, what should our attitude about people who celebrate differently from us be? So we're going to look into what does the Bible say about spooky things. What example did Jesus himself give us about doing something that I hear a lot of people criticizing for today? And uh, they don't know the facts. They don't know the history. But hey, when does that keep people from criticizing somebody else, right? All right. Um, so let me look at... Um, 
the first scripture. Well, let's look at the Old Testament. Now, some people say, well, we don't live by the Old Testament. Yeah, we do, in a way. Some things changed when Christ died on the cross. We no longer have animal sacrifices. Uh, Wednesday night, we read about the priests reached over and put their hands on an animal, and that animal then was sacrificed. And the sins that the person who reached out and passed them over, ceremoniously, you can't do this in actuality, that ceremoniously the sins of that person were because they ran out of priests, remember. They had priests there, but the priests were not ceremoniously clean. And so some of the younger priests-to-be that were ceremoniously clean could do this. So they reached their hand over and laid hands on an animal and ceremoniously passed the sins of that person to that animal, and the animal was sacrificed. So in other words, they paid the price not with their own life, but they passed their sins to an animal who then paid with its life for that person's sin. Um, so we have the fact that we're in the New Testament doesn't mean thou shalt not kill doesn't exist anymore. Um, thou shalt not sleep with thy neighbor's wife is in the Old Testament. But because we live in the New Testament, we don't just throw out the whole world. So let's, so let's start with the Old Testament one, which is in, um, I'm not even where I wrote it down. It's in Deuteronomy 18. Let's start with the Catholic Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 1. This is a study Bible. Some are Bibles with scripture only, and others are Bibles with teaching that are written next to the scripture. And this is a Catholic Bible. This is a teaching Bible. 10 to 12. You must not have in your midst anyone who makes his child pass through the fire. That was a pagan practice. Or one who practices divination. Uh, that's fortune telling. Or anyone who consults the stars. Uh, that's your horoscope. Who is a sorcerer. Who deals in miracles or happenings through the power of not God, but evil spirits. No diviner, a person who knows stuff, or one who asks questions of the dead. Hey, what would be a good day for me to take a cruise? Or what day is safe for me to fly? For Yahweh abhors those who do those things. And it is precisely for this reason that he drives them away before you. You must be blameless for Yahweh, your God. Those people that you are to drive away, this is Moses giving God's law and its interpretation to the people um, that have just come out of Egypt as slaveries. And he's telling them what you're going to allow and what you're not going to allow. The people that you're supposed to drive away, get them away from you, have nothing to do with them. Those people you are to drive away listened to 
sorcerers, and diviners. But Yahweh, your God, has provided you with something different. He will raise up for you a prophet like myself from among the people. Moses wasn't literally a prophet in that he did not tell the future. But he was a prophet in that he got a word from God and he passed that word to the people. So he says, he will raise up for you a prophet from your brothers, other Jews, like myself. These prophets that God's going to raise up, he will tell them things and they will tell things to you. Like God tells me stuff and I tell you. To whom you shall listen. And then he just goes on to talk about prophets. Um, I just happened to read the Catholic version. Uh, we're going to go to a New Testament now that I think nobody has any question with. We're in Ephesians 5. And I'll pick up. Uh, this is a sort of a Baptist-like uh, publishing house. Um, Ephesians 5. I'm almost there. 7 to 12. Therefore, do not become their partners. Well, maybe I better back up and see what they're talking about. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments for these, for because of these things, God's wrath is coming on the disobedient. Oh, he's talking about disobedience. So you don't take people who don't obey God. Don't become their partners. That's sort of like uh, one of my sermons uh, on Preacher with Parrots, uh, which uh, talks about um, don't be unequally yoked. Bible says don't marry somebody that doesn't believe like you because you're going to have a hard time coming together when basic beliefs aren't together. And the same thing works for business partners. Anybody that you're going to have to make decisions with and uh, work together closely with. Mm -hmm. If he's telling them if they're disobedient, don't become their partners. For once they were in darkness. But now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children in the light, for the fruit of the light results in goodness, righteousness, and truth. Discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Well, we haven't really gotten into anything really strong yet. Um, discerning... Now, those that walk in the light in all goodness and righteousness and truth, discerning means you know the difference between what pleases the Lord and what doesn't. Don't participate. Now they're getting to the reason this scripture is on everybody's list. Discerning what's pleasing to the Lord, what pleases the Lord and what doesn't. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness. What is a fruitless work? If you do something and you have good success, it's fruitful. If you do something and it bombs, it's fruitless. You did something, but nothing good came out of it. That's the difference between fruitful and fruitless. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness evil, pagan, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made clear. In other words, you take something that you're not sure whether it's good or bad, put a light on it. 
you'll see details you won't see without the light. He's saying expose it to God's word. Use God's word to examine something. Uh, God's word is light. And you hold something up to God's word to take a good look at it. If you don't do that, what are you going to have? You're going to have, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. Or you're going to have. Well, I got a friend that's a Baptist pastor, and he says, or you're going to have. Well, I don't have to celebrate it the same way the Catholics celebrate it. That's what you get when you take a passing glance at something. But when you hold it up to the light, and examine it. You get details that you don't get by doing that. He said, if something is involved in darkness, expose it to God's light, which is the word. Get a good look at it. Otherwise, it's your opinion. And one person's opinion is as good as another. My opinion is not any better than yours. Yours is not better than somebody else's. Uh, everything exposed by the light is made clear. For what makes everything clear is light. Therefore, it is said, get up, sleeper, rise up from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. Pay careful attention to how you walk. That means how you live, what you do every day. You've heard people talk about Christians should walk to walk and not just talk to talk. Not just say, well, I'm in Sunday school every Sunday morning, but on Monday I just do as I very well please. That's, he says, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of your time because your day, the days are evil. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk with wine. Now, I think it was, um, we'll get to that tonight. We finish up First Timothy and go into the book of Titus. And I guess it isn't in 1 Timothy. When we get into 2 Timothy, I believe is when Paul tells, now he's an older man, he's a mentor to a very young preacher who is just starting to pastor a church in Ephesus. It's not the book of Ephesians, it's the book of 1 Timothy. It's called a pastoral letter because it's from one pastor to another. But he tells him, there is in wine something medicinal and you have a stomach problem so Paul is telling him later we may not get to it tonight but we will eventually on a Sunday night Paul is telling him take some wine as medicine and here he says don't get drunk with wine well there's a difference to taking medicine and taking anything, whether it's a drug, which is usually a chemical uh, product that gives you a similar result to a natural product, such as wine or a plant. He says, don't be drunk with wine, because you do reckless things but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to each other in the fear of God. 
I'll keep, well, I'll go back to the Catholic Bible for whatever else. Well, wait, I have another Catholic Bible here. It's a modern version. Let me get it out. It's the same wording as the Protestant version, except it has the extra dual canonical books. Basically, this scripture is saying, don't mess with things that are not good, not holy, but that could be considered questionable. Um, the other scripture that I'm going to read has to do with our attitude toward people that don't see this sermon the same way somebody else sees this sermon. No, that on October 31st, around the world, people will be doing spooky things. Because that's what people do on Halloween. When my dad was, a, now when I was a kid, we went out, we used to say help the poor. I, I grew up in Michigan, and I talked to people in Indiana and nearby states to tell me the same thing. They use the same kind of expression and words that I do. We used to say help the poor, and people would give us candy. We didn't get to pick or anything, and we dressed up as something or another. Uh, as a child, I never did any of this on Halloween. When I got to be a a preteen, and I went on my first group date. It means I went with a boyfriend that we were with all of the youth of our church, a Baptist church in Hazel Park, Michigan. And we went on a hayride. And that Baptist church, Calvary Baptist Church, was doing what a lot of churches do nowadays. They take a day which in its history has questionable stuff, Scare away the spooks. And they say, well, our kids have got to have fun. And who better than to prepare them to have fun than the church? All of us girls, and we were about 13 years old, counted how many kisses we got. And, and they were all on the cheeks. And my first kiss was from, a, from a boy was on that church hayride. I'm not going to comment on it. I, uh, that's what kids do when you put them on the back of a wagon and you fill it with hay and horses drive you around and then you get out after an hour driving around a country road on a hay wagon and you have... Um, apple juice and you bob for apples. That, and so many churches do something similar. Uh, a church of my denomination that's about uh, 30 miles from here, I heard last year they did something called trunk, uh, trunk to trunk, or you know how kids go house to house um, for candy? Well, the people from the church that wanted to participate, they had candy and, and goodies in the trunks of their car. And I guess to keep them safe, to let them go from house to house for candy, they parked in the church parking lot or on the street when the parking lot got full, but it was right near the church. And the kids from the church went from place to place. Um, the question comes, because of its history, should we as Christians have anything at all to do with it? 
should we say, okay, you can dress up, but don't come as a witch? Should we say, candy is good? <laughs> should we say, hey, anything anti-God, anything God was against in the Old Testament, spooks, horoscopes, devils, a demon is the same thing as a devil. Uh, demons are fallen angels. There was a rebellion in God between in, in on in heaven between Genesis one and Genesis one 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 and Genesis one two. When one third of the angels rebelled against God and were kicked out, they landed on Earth. That's why in Genesis one one the Earth was fine, and in Genesis one two, oh, not too good. God has to redo it. During that time, the angels had come down. It's called the gap theory. It's been around among Christian ministers of all denominations for, oh, I want to say 40, 50 years. About that. Uh, it turned out to be somebody's doctoral thesis, or uh, I guess master's is thesis, doctor's is a dissertation. I'm not sure which one it was. Uh, but it brought part of this out and then it opened up everybody's eyes and everybody has studied it and it's called the gap theory. That there was a gap in history during which some stuff that happened, and, and, and anyway, demons are fallen angels. They sided with Satan against God. So if you're dealing with a demon or you're dealing with, and, and they are God's enemies and the reason they bother Christians is if you don't like an old man, you go after his grandchildren or after his kids. That's the way life is. Let me read first before I start giving you some options of whether you compromise and do Halloween or whether you say, mm -mm, not for me. Uh, let me read from the uh, Living Bible. This came out in the 70s. It was first uh, the, the main portion of it, not the deuterocanonical books. Um, it came out while I was on my way. I was actually driving through Texas when I heard on the radio that it was now published as a whole Bible. It had been living word, living New Testament, living letters, uh, living psalms, um, living gospels, and they finally got finished with the whole Bible, and it was the Living Bible, and I had it sent to me. I was teaching at a school in, in Central America, and uh, I had it, I had somebody buy one and send me one down there, so I'm reading from that version, and the Catholics didn't change that. They should have. There's, I mean, there's a couple of things in here in their Bible that don't agree with their doctrine. In the Catholic Living Bible, it says the same thing as the Protestant Living Bible. So everybody ought to agree with this. Give a warm welcome. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. And the Jewish people had just been kicked out of Rome. Now, one of the Caesars didn't like Jews and kicked them all out of Rome. And there were still Christians in Rome. Some were Jews and some were um uh, converted Gentiles. So there were Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, Jewish believers. And some of them didn't have a pastor because the ones who knew more were, had been around longer were the Jews. The converted pagans were new and they didn't have as much teaching. So your pastors and your Christian overseers were mostly Jewish Christians and they had just Lost. They had just been kicked out of Rome. So this is 14th chapter of Rome. Give a warm welcome to any brother who wants to join you, even though his faith is weak. Don't criticize him for being for having different ideas from yours about what is right and wrong. Now we're not saying yet what you should do on Halloween. We're talking about what should you do if somebody's idea is different from yours. 
For instance, don't argue with him whether or not to eat meat that's been offered to idols. You may believe there's no harm in this, uh, but the faith of others is, if the faith of others is weaker, they think it's wrong. They will go without meat at all and eat vegetables rather than that kind of meat. Those who think it's okay to eat meat must not look down on those who won't. And if you're one of those who won't, don't find fault with those who do. What is he talking about? Strange, we do have pagan gods here. There, I was in Hawaii. Uh, now, I've preached in Hawaii, but on this occasion, I was a tourist. And I was a on a bus. And a Japanese driver took us through the cemetery where many American soldiers were buried um, after uh, December 7th on Pearl Harbor Day. So many lost their life. And many Americans, when they go to Hawaii on the Big Island, they want to see this cemetery. This man was Japanese. Um, was not Christian. And obviously not Jewish. And he said, well, he said, a lot of you people think that we people are strange because we offer food to our ancestors that are dead and buried. And you people say to our people, when are they going to come up and eat the food? He said, and I'd like to ask you people, you put flowers on your people's graves. When are your dead people going to come up and smell the flowers? Um, obviously, he had been hearing What about what is offered to the dead? Uh, food was offered in this time of history by non-Christians and non-Jews. So you might as well use the word pagan. That's what a, Christ, a pagan is, non-Christian, non-Jew. But they were smart. They didn't let it rot. <laughs> like we let our flowers wilt on the grave. They would offer food, meat, to idols for an hour or two. And then they would take it away and take it to the grocery store and sell it for 79 cents a pound. No, I'm kidding. I don't know what they sold it for. Um, but it was sold for a cheaper amount of money because it had been sitting uh, at the gravesite uh, of a dead person for a couple of hours. But it hadn't hurt the meat. If you look at your meat, you'll find in your meat market, at least where I shop, some of it, it'll say, must be eaten within 24 hours, and it'll give you a date. And others, you know, it doesn't say that, and you know that you've got five to six days that you don't have to stick it in the freezer, and it's going to be good. The thing of it is, the Jews, therefore Jewish Christians, you don't change everything about yourself when you become saved. You have some habits, some customs that come with you. And the Jews couldn't eat meat which had been offered to idols. But the mystery of the gospel is that the gospel is also for Gentiles. And the Gentiles were just as much saved as the Jewish Christians. And they said, we don't see, we don't have a problem with eating food that's been sitting in front of an idol. It's got just as much protein. It's got just as much fat. You cook it the same way. And it's cheaper. So when it's talking about offering food, food to all, that's been given to the dead or to idols. That's what it's talking about. Paul, the leader of the Gentile Christians, went and had a meeting with Peter, 
who was the leader of the Jewish Christians, and John, um, James, who was the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem and was the half-brother to Jesus. James and Peter thought nobody should eat feet and meat offered to idols. Um, and Paul didn't really see a problem with it. But they went and they talked it over. They said, really, the problem is how we're treating each other. It's not in the meat. It's in our attitudes. And they decided that some things, they would just simply give up in order to keep peace. We're not talking Protestants and Catholics. We're talking Baptists and Presbyterians. <laughs> we're talking about people that were quite close, but there were some differences. And he, they said, we're going to come to an agreement. We don't see anything wrong with the meat. But we will voluntarily give it up. We want to have fellowship. We want to love you. So this is what they were talking about with the meat. Those who think it's all right to eat such meat must not look down on those who won't. And if you're one of those that don't find fault with those who do. For God has accepted them to be his children. In other words, God doesn't accept you or reject you on whether you eat meat offered to idols. And God isn't going to throw you out of the kingdom or give you a great big blessing over whether you have something in your church on Halloween. Please accept that. I got up this morning and I have had a little difficulty picking up messages. I haven't had difficulty with my emails. I've got two email accounts on this prayer and phrases on this, and um, one Gmail is on this. Uh, when I sent out notices last night, sometimes if I have a friend, I don't have time to write a call. But I'm sending out notices, or I'm sending out prayer and praise, and I just send it to them. They, they know I'm thinking about them, okay? And when I'm checking off who I'm inviting to today and tonight's programs, I send this to a friend in Africa. Well, she's not a missionary. She lives there. And uh, it said that I would be speaking today on the subject satanic or secular. Secular simply means non-religious. Something we do in America, but it's non-religious or satanic because Easter is not secular it's religious Christmas is not secular it's religious Fourth of July is not secular it's political it's historical well she read this well she sent me a text and uh, it's somebody that I don't know personally. Obviously, I haven't been to South Africa. And this is salt. I mean, this is on the water that if you're going to take before, before they opened up the Panama Canal, this is where you could only go on a boat to certain places at certain times of the year because of the weather. This is that far in South Africa, right on the water. Well, I, I, I got up. And I had trouble last night picking up text messages. I had five, and I couldn't get them out of this thing. I had to turn it off, turn it on. It couldn't, I couldn't make it work. So I get up this morning, and I say, oh, I got a text message. Okay, let's we'll see if I can make it work. I turned it on. It's from her. I had sent her the same notice that, that some of you got and said I would be speaking on the topic. Uh, secular, uh, satanic or secular? One word from Africa. One word as a text message. 
a cult. I was going to say we don't. I should say you don't. Most of you probably don't know a lot about demons. I don't know whether you've ever dealt with one or not. I have. But I've been in the ministry for 62 years, and I've been halfway around the world. So you would expect that in my lifetime, I remember when live video was closing down. And I went on, I had a playlist, and you could be offline and work on your playlist. But to put it on and make it official, you had to be online. So I went on, and of course, everybody that came through could see I was on. And I'm sure some got an email. And it wasn't very long. I had five, six, seven, eight people there. And all of a sudden, words were written across the top of the screen. Now, here we have a super op that can do certain things. We didn't have that at live video. Certain things only I could do. Like words I'm reading now. Preacher with Paris is a room dedicated to studying the Bible. In those days, in that place, I was the only one who could write that. I'm looking at it. Hmm. And somebody's writing something else. Writing where only I can write. Now that is what we call supernatural. It is not in the natural order of things. The network wasn't set up to work that way. And this um, person who was an employee of live video wanted to come on and sort of apologize to God and to me. He didn't want God to think that he was taking me off the air. They were taking programs. The way they did it, they would go off. Preach with parents, Larry, Granny, Denny, did it, Jane, Grace. They would, one by one, just knock everybody off. And he came to my program and we don't want you and we don't want God to think that we're knocking him off the air. <laughs> but before they said that, they started out by saying, we know you're a woman of God. You know, the Bible says that demons know who God is. Of course they were. They were once angels in heaven, your personal friends. Um, and people like myself usually can you recognize demonic activity. If you've never seen it, if you don't know anything about it, it which m m so many Americans have not, uh, demons are freer in other places to do things where there is less Christianity. There is more Christianity here and you know, more people that know how to deal with demons, so you have less of it here. But anyway, when he said, the, the Bible says that demons believe in God, they fear God, they believe in him, but they're his enemies. But they know all about God and his works. I, they were angels that once lived in heaven. So this person types in, we know you are a woman of God. <laughs> And I think, hmm, I don't know why an angel would be typing that in. <laughs> that must be a demon. And I said, okay, we've settled it now who I work for. Who's your boss? Now, that person, if they were a demon, would have to tell me. They could not lie to me. And it was kind of funny because uh, some people who followed me 
you know, over to other networks and eventually came over here with me. We're, we're there that night. And uh, once in a while, we, we remember it. But he said, oh, no, no, no. I know what you mean. I'm not serving Satan. No. I came to apologize. We, we're not throwing God off the network. <laughs> we're closing the network because they owe us money and they haven't paid us. So we're closing the network down. But when I started seeing strange things happening, writing where only I could write, and I don't know anything about hackers. I don't know how to do this kind of stuff. What do I know about that? But it was kind of strange activity. Um, if you know anything, if you've ever had any contact with a demon or any shady occultic things you stay as far away from it as you can and people in other countries where there are fewer Christians fewer Bibles less preaching of the word Christians in those countries know all about it now we had the church that I pastored here on the mountain we rented it to a Spanish speaking congregation from Guatemala they had knowledge of demons in fact they had some guy came in and I for lack of better language I will just say they pitched a fit and broke some things and I said if you don't know how to deal why didn't you call me I'm 20 30 minutes away I could have been here but these things exist, and if you don't know about it, then you don't know about it. This congregation, I'll tell you what I did, and I'll tell you what they did on Halloween. They rented the building from us. They had an all-night prayer meeting against demonic things happening because many demons and many I'm looking for a general word that will cover the whole scene of this occult type thing. Occult means dark, darkness, dark things happening, spooky, that type of thing. They choose sometimes to do bad things on Halloween. It's because of the history of where it came from and so forth. So a pope started it. They could care less. Uh, because of the history of the Day of the Dead and all of that, more so. And they, that's, that's how they spent it. Their, their whole night was spent in prayer uh, for protection for Christians and so forth. What did I do? Well, I'm not much of a compromiser. If this hand doesn't agree with this hand, and if this hand gives up something and this hand gives up so that they can get closer, is that good or bad? Well, it depends. What did you give up to get closer to the other guy? There are some doctrinal things in Scripture the soul gal doesn't give up. I'm not selling out all of my faith just to get along with somebody in another church we've got to take this and it said they're God's servants not yours something Christians should observe Christian holidays Jewish holidays and special days others say it's wrong and foolish to go to all the trouble for every day is like another day to God so that's like us in the seventh day Adventist on questions of this kind, everyone must decide for himself. Now, I'm not getting out of it. I'm not, I'm not failing to give you what I feel. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. If you have special days for worshiping the Lord and you're trying to honor him, you're doing a good thing. So is the person who eats meat that has been offered to idols. That person isn't doing a sin. Mm. He too is anxious to please the Lord and he's thankful. We are not, listen to this, we are not our own bosses to live or die 
as we ourselves might choose. We don't get, we shouldn't think that it's up to us to make the rules. Living or dying, we follow the Lord. Either way, we're his. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, so that he can be our Lord both while we live and when we die. You have no right to criticize your brother or look down on him. Remember, each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God. Yes, each of us will give an account of himself to God. So don't criticize each other anymore. Instead, try to live in a way that you think will not make your brother stumble. What I do will affect my friend in Africa. They have confidence in me. What I do will affect other people much more than it will me. It is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow. Don't criticize each other anymore. Try instead to live in a way that you'll never make your brother stumble. I don't want my person to have to have a battle because I either did or did not have Halloween in my church. By letting him see that you're doing something he thinks is wrong. Not that's wrong. That he thinks is wrong. Or that she thinks is right. Not what is. As for myself, I'm sure on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is pretty high authority for an apostle to say. I'm sure. There's nothing really wrong in eating meat that's been offered idols. But. If somebody believes it's wrong, then he shouldn't do it. For him, it's wrong. And if your brother is bothered by what you eat, you're not acting in love if you go ahead and eat it. If there are people that are going to be hurt, because I have Halloween in my church, and I shouldn't have it. Well, we're going to get to my kids, okay? We're not, we're not going to leave the kids out there. Um, even though you know what to do is right, there are other people that don't know as much about the Word of God as I do. 62 years in the ministry. Four years in Bible college. Master's degree. Written a doctoral dissertation wrote two books in Spanish for to be to be used in Bible schools. Obviously I can't expect somebody that tunes in to have this same information. It doesn't make me better. It means I'm older and have studied more. Important thing is not what we eat or drink but the goodness and peace and joy from the Holy Spirit. If you let Christ be Lord in these affairs, God will be glad and so will the others. In this way, you aim for harmony in the church and you try to build each other up. I'm not going to tear you down because you do this or tear you down because you do that. My job is to educate you and I hope that that's what I'm doing. And this way you aim for harmony in the church and you build each other up. Don't undo the work of God for a chunk of meat. If God has died for someone and saved them, and you're going to cause them to lose their salvation because of what they do with meat? The right thing to do is to quit eating meat or drinking wine or anything. Somebody asked me, I think, Wednesday night, and I felt later, I don't think I answered them properly on Wednesday night. I said some, there are some churches that used to be against drinking that are now accepting drinking beer or wine. You get drunk slower on beer or wine. For those of you that aren't drinkers, I'm not a drinker, but 
I have a lot of information to what I read. You can have a, a, a little bit of whiskey and get drunk real fast. Or you can, because there's more bulk, in order to get the same amount of alcohol, it takes longer to get drunk on wine or beer than what it does on whiskey. So there are some that used to be against any amount of whiskey that are now saying, well, if you take it in either beer or wine, it's not all that bad. Look, you don't know the addicts. I grew up with one. And you would feel differently if you were in my shoes. You may know that there's nothing wrong with what you do, even from God's point of view, but keep it to yourself. Don't flaunt your faith in front of others who might be hurt by it. In this situation, happy is the man who does not sin by doing what he knows is right. You can do with the right thing and it can be sin. Yeah. If you hurt another person, you cause another person to leave the church because of what you say or do about it. That's wrong. But anyone who believes that something he wants to do is wrong shouldn't do it. He sins if he does. Regardless, look, I can give up spoops and goblins. It's not going to hurt me to not do it. It's not going to hurt me to do it. But if by doing it, I hurt somebody, and like I said, you all don't know as much about demons as I do, but there are those who do. There are those in this country who have lived in other countries. And there are some in this country that have been hurt by demons. You may not be aware of it. And you may do things out of, that hurt people out of ignorance because you simply don't know. Happy is the man who does not sin by doing what's right. He does what he thinks is right, but in doing it, he sins. How does he sin? By doing the right thing, because by doing what he does, right or wrong, it makes another person leave God and leave the church and leave the teaching of the Bible. Anyone who believes something he wants to do is wrong, shouldn't do it. If he thinks it's wrong, and so for him it is wrong. Somebody that says demons running around on Halloween, even if Pope Gregory picked up the Day of the Dead, or not Pope Gregory, but another Pope, decided that November 1st and October 31st would be the Halloween Eve to the Mass for the Day of All Saints, Even that is done apart from what he feels is sin. Uh, I won't get to this that I was going to because I'm already about three minutes past my regular time. What I did on the same night, well, not on the same night, uh, I, I think we did it either earlier that day or the next day, I'm not sure. Um, the first year that I was at that church, I took all the birds. I had about 20 at that time. And I had some big ones that have since passed away. I had a big cockatoo that was really sweet and loved everybody, just like a cat or a dog just kissing everybody. Because Captain is not a kisser or a lover. And um, had them there. We made chili and hot dogs. There's a rule. Mm -hmm. it, it's called ministerial ethics. The, the way preachers behave with other preachers. If you have ever pastored a church, you don't go there regularly after you're no longer the pastor. Because pastors um, are... The people look to you as a leader and do what you say, usually. <laughs> and when you have a change in 
leadership, if the same pastor hangs around, it's going to be harder for the new pastor, for the people to want to give that person their trust and their love and so forth. But because none of that bothered me, I'm different. Um, I took the people who pastored there before and made them my invited guests. And I, I didn't, I made a big point just in case anybody else knew that pastors aren't supposed to come back. I said, hey, they're my guests. I asked them to come back. I brought them back. And so I brought some people who were no longer in the church. I brought them back for that night. And the birds were there. And we ate something different. And my children were not without something interesting to do. They were not without something fun to do. We had nothing about the history of Hollywood. We had no demons. We had no witches. We had no... Um, we didn't even use the word. That's what I did. Some have candy and in some churches they have you dress up as somebody from the Bible. I guess the witch of Endor. <laughs> Nobody came as, as her. Um, we, we had to get together on a night which was not our regular church night. And we had fun. We enjoyed ourselves. And we just had a meeting. That's all. I'm not going to criticize other pastors who do something differently. Not after reading Romans 14, I'm not. I am going to mention it. Did Jesus ever do anything tough? I had the, somebody ask the question, well, Jesus says be kind and be gentle. And he went into church and he took the money changers and he took the people that were selling animals and he knocked them over. Just tore the whole thing up and stopped it. I want to tell you about that. Why were there money changers in the temple? And why were there people with cages with animals at the temple? Read the second chapter of Acts. This when the Holy Spirit fell upon 120 people in the city of Jerusalem. And in the book of Acts, all of these people heard languages being spoken that they spoke in their own country. But they said, these guys are fishermen, and some of them are farmers. They don't know what their language is. In the second chapter of Acts, you get a listing, and we read them the other day for some reason or another, of all the countries these people came from on feast days. Now, recently we did the blood moons thing, and we talked about the importance of feast days. On feast days, they had to go to the temple. There was one temple in the whole world, and we had people from 50 countries. Are they going to bring a lamb from Libya and cross over or from Serene over into Libya and from Libya into Egypt and from Egypt into Arabia and from Arabia into Israel? So they would have a lamb to sacrifice in the temple? No. It would be much easier if they left their lamb at home, traveled on foot or camel or donkey, got to Jerusalem. Well, first of all, if you're from Libya, you got to change your money. If, if you're from, uh, well, I was doing some business about some Bibles in South Africa. The money there is a ram. The money in Mexico is a peso. The money in um, Quetzal, in where I used to live, 
uh, then beat us in Honduras. So before you can do anything, you've got to get your money changed into somebody else's, in, into the money, in, in, into the money of, of Israel. And then you bought the animal. So having animals at the temple and having money changers at the temple was providing a service so that the people who came from around the world could do what they needed to do and get what they needed to get to properly practice their faith. They weren't doing that. They took advantage of it. It would be the sa It's the same as uh, I can remember when neighbors would see that they didn't know the church on the corner was having a, a big convention and people would be coming from all over. And it takes a long time in, in the kitchen of a church to cook for all the people that when it's totally full and neighbors will get out and put a little stand up, put a little table up, and they're selling drinks, and they're selling tortillas, and they're selling um, pupusas, and they're selling burritos, and they're selling tacos. Now, if they're doing this because the people need to eat, and they need to make money, it's a good thing. If they're taking advantage, or if they're overcharging or then it's not a good thing. So they were there to meet a need, but they weren't meeting it. The money changers and the animal sales, that was a logical thing you had to do to practice the Jewish religion in the temple if you didn't live in Israel. What did Jesus do? He said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. And he, so sometimes our actions may appear to be a little strict. A little, come on, Jesus, you're going too far. No, you're not. Jesus, by the way, existed with the Father when creation was made. He said, let us make man in our own image. He's, God the Father is talking to God the Son. Jesus didn't begin to exist in a manger in Bethlehem. He existed in a human body beginning in a manger in Bethlehem. But John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And God was, and the word was in the beginning with, with God, and everything that was made was made by him. And if something exists, it doesn't exist unless it was made by him. We don't play with things like this. And personally, I won't do anything that will hurt anybody who wants to leave demons and this kind of stuff away. So personally, I will do things that are not attached to this so they won't hurt anybody. And hopefully, people will enjoy themselves because we all need to go to a party once in a while. And we'll all be able to get along and we'll all practice Romans 14. And that's the end of my message. And I'm 14 minutes past the time I usually end. Uh, hang on those that are here uh, on my live broadcast while I take just a second.